Right, welcome everybody to the uh, October meeting of uh, the Mornington Peninsula Astronomical uh, Society. And um, we'll just uh, first of all look at uh, some of the things that have occurred uh, in the last uh, month since we last uh, met. Uh, a few days ago we had the uh, NASA Psyche mission take off from uh, Cape Canaveral, and I won't say very much about this mission because one of our members uh, went over there and uh, saw the launch, and maybe we'll get a talk or something from him uh, next month about it. So I won't uh, do too much other than to actually uh, show at the top right there what uh, the, uh, the Psyche spacecraft looks like when it's uh, unfurled. It's sort of about the size of a tennis court. And uh, although there's no image of um, the asteroid Psyche yet, um, uh, what NASA has put out is, uh, is their best, uh, best image from radar data shown uh, in the, uh, the middle right there. And it's believed to be uh, an, an almost all metallic um, asteroid, so very, very unusual and uh, an absolute um, mining heaven if, uh, if it uh, proves to be so, to have everything uh, sort of concentrated. Uh, to give you an idea, it's about 220 kilometres uh, diameter, so this is a big lump of rock that uh, is out at uh, the asteroid belt. Pro maybe even multi more than trillions even. <laughs> yeah. um, so, um, it, it, so Psyche actually took off and um, is uh, heading for Mars at the moment. It will use a gravity slingshot effect around Mars to fling it out a little bit wider uh, and uh, it will arrive at the orbit of Psyche in uh, 2029 whereby it will take a, a year or two of reconnaissance. Um, we also had the uh, OSIRIS-REx craft come back and we'll see a lot about that uh, later on uh, this evening. That one went to a much smaller asteroid, Bennu. Uh, Bennu is uh, the name of an Egyptian bird. The ones that you see in hieroglyphs is, uh, is Bennu. And all the features on um, the asteroid Bennu are named after birds. So uh, where the probe actually touched down and uh, took a sample of asteroid Bennu, which you'll see a little bit later, um, that was called Nightingale, for example, is, uh, is uh, that particular uh, point. Uh, down the bottom there, uh, up in Western Australia, we had a, um, a large uh, radio dish that had been mothballed uh, not long after the um, Apollo era. And that has now been resurrected by the Canadians for uh, um, tracking geostationary satellites. Uh, also announced that the West Australian Police are fitting all their cars with Starlink um, by the end of next year. So they'll, they'll be on uh, Elon Musk's uh, trail of uh, satellites uh, streaming across uh, the sky. Uh, and obvious benefits, particularly in Western Australia, where you have very large, vast uh, distances and maybe not uh, particularly good uh, telecommunications uh, otherwise. And uh, bottom right over there we see... Um, the uh, launching of uh, items into uh, Earth orbit by flinging them around in a big circle and uh, spitting them out the top of that machine. Uh, it's 50 metres uh, diameter and they have uh, trialled this uh, a number of times. Uh, this is a California company has, uh, has been trialling them for uh, putting large amounts of payload over a period of time into space. Uh, basically uh, slingshots them out uh, and into space, spits them up. Uh, and they're looking at Mundrabilla, which is in Western Australia, near the um, sort, sort of near the edge of uh, the Nullarbor uh, uh, over there to actually put it. So uh, we may very well end up having one of these if it looks uh, favourable. I suppose over in the Nullarbor, if something goes wrong and it uh, spits something out at very high speed, um, the chances of it hitting uh, someone is uh, pretty remote. Right, so welcome tonight any new members. I'm not sure I have any uh, new ones here tonight, but I'll read out the new members since our last meeting. We have uh, Jiffen Kurian, Wendy Keys, Pam Bell, uh, Russell Thompson again, uh, Mark Raymond and family, and uh, Sylvia uh, Coslow. Um, anyone here tonight? No, no, none here tonight, so I won't uh, ask the committee to uh, put up their hands and we'll uh, keep marching on. So as usual, we'll look at uh, what we've done in the past month uh, and what's coming up. Then I'll throw over to Chris for the uh, astrophotography thing. Then Guido for Sky for the month. And he's looking uh, remarkably uh, awake for someone who's uh, come back from America not too long ago. And uh, then over to uh, Eden for uh, Cosmic Corner. And uh, then we'll look at um, the, a bit about the geology of the solar system. This talk is from a couple of years ago. 
and uh, it's from someone who's on the OSIRIS-REx team and also the Hayabusa uh, team that went to the asteroid Ryugu and uh, she'll talk a bit about uh, the solar system and the geology of the solar system and also the OSIRIS-REx mission which is now being rebranded uh, because the, uh, the main mother craft is uh, being redirected away from Earth and onto uh, the next uh, asteroid. Then afterwards we'll uh, have a, um, a shorter videos. Uh, uh, Sarah Russell again talking about uh, what meteorites can specifically tell us about uh, asteroids and she'll say something about the Winchcombe uh, meteorite in the UK that landed in someone's um, front driveway. Uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, that, that one is a very similar one to the one that landed in Murchison here in Victoria. Uh, and th those are similar in, in uh, type to uh, the asteroid Bennu as well being uh, carbonaceous. Then we'll have about seven minutes on uh, explaining the basics of uh, spectroscopy. How do you actually tell things about uh, remote objects that you can't get to other than by the light that uh, comes from them? Uh, and indeed a lot of how they know uh, with the, the asteroid psyche, with the mission that's heading there, um, is uh, number one by spectroscopy, the light that's reflected uh, from it, uh, and also by uh, bouncing uh, radar off it, at least while the Arecibo telescope was uh, in one piece. Uh, and then uh, a, a very short one at the end on uh, the Hubble tension, and we'll close with uh, the launch of uh, OSIRIS-REx right through to its uh, recent sample return just a couple of uh, weeks ago and they've now opened that up and uh, had a bit of a look inside and got, uh, got a few surprises from uh, what they've seen so far. So recent events, um, after the last meeting we had the uh, working bee as usual that weekend then Shortly afterwards, uh, Catherine and I spoke at uh, Martha Cove Retirement Village, a very large uh, retirement village in uh, Mount Martha, and uh, we had a, a good turnout for that uh, initial one there, and they all seemed to know Catherine already, and uh, that, was, uh, that was a good evening. We don't usually do um, viewing nights at retirement villages. I can't recall having done one previously, so maybe this is the, uh, the start of uh, many things to come. Uh, followed shortly afterwards by a committee meeting that we really was on um, planning for uh, future events coming up. Then Trevor went out to Frankston Library, their branch at Carrum Downs, and gave them a talk. Uh, they had booked in over 90 people, but only 35 turned up on uh, the day to hear his talk. But uh, nevertheless, he gave his, uh, his talk. That one didn't have any telescopes. Uh, public night went uh, really well where Gita gave the talk and uh, we <coughs> didn't have much cloud that evening so they uh, got a good uh, view of the night. Then uh, Manfred who's here tonight went and talked to another retirement uh, village at uh, Village Glen down uh, on the uh, there, towards the end of the uh, peninsula and again it's the first time we've been down there and uh, he had uh, 30 people uh, turn up for that and last night we were out at Parkdale for uh, the annual uh, uh, stargazing night for them for uh, Parkdale Secondary College but it was absolutely no cloud and very uh, steady conditions so good good viewing for them and they were very happy at the end of uh, the day uh, ha uh, going there and sh shown in the background there are some photos that uh, Phil took um, on the night inside their theatrette and also outside uh, on, the, on the park. Now coming up we've got a fair amount uh, coming up We've got the uh, TLD, Telescope Learning Day, this uh, Saturday for those who've booked. Um, if you haven't booked and you wanted to come, well, we hold these twice a year now, so you might have to wait for the next one. Um, and it's probably got a very long waiting list, I would say, of uh, maybe a, a couple of dozen people waiting to come in if anyone uh, drops out at the last moment. Uh, then this coming Sunday, we've got the uh, visitor shown on the top right there, Claude Alterac, uh, who's coming from France. Um, it's his first time in the Southern Hemisphere and he wants to image the uh, Southern Hemisphere. Uh, so hopefully uh, we'll have some, some people here who can help connect his uh, camera to uh, some of our instruments here and uh, either piggyback it or uh, do um, eyepiece uh, projection uh, through them. And he'll be giving us a talk here uh, at 5pm so uh, any members who wish to come uh, to that talk are more than welcome and then he'll stay on a little bit later after dark, assuming it's not pouring with rain, because you never know what the weather can do uh, around here at the moment. 
Um, uh, I suspect it probably will be rain if it's nice and clear tonight and, uh, and last night, but uh, fingers crossed for that one. A couple of days later, we're back up to Beau Morris again for uh, the school that uh, Alex Cherney was associated with, Stella Morris. And this year it's uh, a lot uh, smaller in size. I think we had about the 200 mark the last time we, uh, we went up there. And uh, so that uh, will reduce the number of telescopes we need to, uh, to take up there to that primary school, which um, is uh, you know, a bit of welcome news. Uh, a couple of days later, we've got year twos, which are rather young uh, primary school level up at uh, Nentone Primary. And we've got 50 year twos. They're having a sleepover. So if they fall asleep uh, during the talk or, or out, outside, doesn't matter. They'll just be carried a short distance uh, indoors to their bed, I, I would imagine. And um, then that Friday, the next day, will be the uh, uh, usual uh, SCAG night, the Scouts, Cubs and Guides night. And uh, we've already got the first Seaford Scouts are booked in for that one. And uh, there may be others booked in uh, uh, since, uh, since I last actually had a look in there to see who had booked. Committee has been bounced uh, by a week, delayed a week, because um, of uh, its overlap with one of those viewing nights. So it's exactly one week later than normal. Uh, next public uh, stargazing night, uh, we're well and truly booked. 102 are booked in there. Um, and of course, not, not everyone's going to turn up on that night. So it's not as if we will be back to like pre-COVID uh, capacity where 102 would be fairly normal. Uh, Trevor should be back by then. He's uh, currently cru cruising across the uh, equator on, on a cruise ship, talking there, astronomy. And he should be back by then to, uh, to talk at that. Um, and then cu coming up uh, after the next uh, meeting, we've got Vastrock actually approaching, where we've got 62 booked uh, so far. And uh, the next uh, concert that's uh, Christmas related on the 8th of December, Bo, bookings for that one haven't uh, opened as yet. All right, uh, welcome everybody to AstroMofo, uh, our monthly photo challenge. Uh, so those of you who don't know, this is the uh, challenge that we set to members every month where we pick an object or a group of objects to photograph and uh, members then go off and um, take their photos. And uh, this one was the gas giants. This is uh, challenge number nine and it was the gas giants, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus and um, Neptune. The only f image that we didn't get this month was um, uh, Uranus, is the only planet we missed out. It's probably rising a bit too late and a bit too low on the horizon. Uh, but to start us off, we've got this uh, very fresh photo from Russell Smith, just taken um, last night uh, of Jupiter. And you can see Io there right next to it in the great red spot. Uh, a little bit low on the horizon through some heat haze and that sort of thing. So not a particularly clear image by uh, Russell's standards, but um, still a great shot by any of ours. So uh, there we have Jupiter. Uh, now rock stars who completed this challenge were Chris, uh, Dave Rolfe, Dominic Lucarelli, Greg Walton, Kelly Clitheroe, Mark Hillen, Nerida Lancake and Russell Smith. And uh, this is uh, Dave at Iron Maiden and we've got um, the Jupiter apparently up in the top right of the image there. And there's my pointer, there it is. So Jupiter just up there. So you could see Jupiter through Iron Maiden's stage lights, and I reckon you could probably see Iron Maiden's stage lights from Jupiter as well. <laughs> uh, now we've got a series of photos here by um, Greg, taken down at the observatory here with the 350 millimeter mead, and a few different shots just showing a few different things. So um, Greg's got his uh, camera with a 0.7 reducer on the mead um, and he's also further stopped it down to 100 mil from 350. So he's got a cover over the telescope with a 100 millimeter opening, uh, which reduces the amount of light going into the telescope, which improves the contrast on the, on the planet. It, it in, uh, increases the focal ratio. So um, a couple of different ones. The top ones show um, a bunch of different teleconverters on there. Um, stack, you stacked them, didn't you, Greg? Yeah. One on top of the other. So we're going from focal ratios of f f75, f225 up to f440, and that's showing the different magnification that you get with the different teleconverters through the um, through the telescope. And they're not 
stretched or cropped. That's the actual size, relative size. Mm. Yep. 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 And that that also has the effect of dimming uh, the object as well. So as you can see, the exposure time has to increase to get a similar brightness in the image. So by increasing your focal ratio, you're dimming the object and having to increase the exposure time will go from half a second at 1600 to one second at 3200 ISO to 1.6 seconds at 6400 ISO just to keep the brightness up on the object that we're shooting. Um, and down the bottom uh, we've got the, the same um, what have we got? The same focal ratio no, the same um, uh, magnification with the six with, with, yeah. Yeah, so same, same magnification, same setting, and then different exposures showing how it comes up at, at different brightness. Uh, one of the other benefits, uh, or the consequence, I suppose, of stopping it down from 350 mil to 100 mil and increasing the focal ratio is that you're also giving yourself a lot more play of the focal point of the camera because you're narrowing down that light cone that, the, that you've got where the light cone focuses it becomes a longer point, so it's a lot more forgiving on your focus. Whereas with a, a, shorter, rap, a, a shorter focal ratio, uh, the light comes in a lot steeper. Where it converges to the focal point, it's a very, very sharp point to focus your camera. So a few different things to think about in um, long focal length photography. Uh, now we've got a um, couple of photos here showing, the, showing off the steady hands of um, Kelly Clitheroe and Mark Hillen. So, Kelly's photo is uh, taken handheld with her camera and a 300 millimeter um, zoom lens and a 1.4 teleconverter. So it's around about 420 mil focal length. And Kelly's got that photo of Saturn just by shoot, holding and shooting the camera and uh, getting that nice sharp little shot there. And uh, Mark Hillen's got this one with his smartphone on his um, uh, 130 mil refractor over a three and a half millimeter eyepiece. So if anyone's tried to take a photo with a smartphone over an eyepiece, even a 20 mil eyepiece, it's not that easy. So even a three and a half millimeter eyepiece, it's, yeah, you need pretty steady hands to do that. So good on uh, Kelly and Mark. And Kelly's a also a member at the Geelong Astronomical Society, if anyone doesn't know. And Geelong uh, offers associate memberships to uh, other, mem other societies as well. So if you're a member here, you can, get an associate membership at um, Geelong as well. Uh, next, what do we got? Ah, Neridas. Okay, so a couple of shots uh, by Nerida. Uh, one of, well, on the right there we've got Saturn going through her um, field of view. Uh, over there on the, um, on the side. So that's uh, sped up four times, so over about 40 seconds Jupiter went from one, uh, Saturn, sorry, went from one side of her field of view to the other. And uh, Nerida got a video of that, stacked the uh, images, the frames from the video, and uh, processed those to get the shot that we have there. So that's all with her smartphone, her Samsung Note 20, 10 inch dob, and the 15 mil eyepiece. Um, now, there's a few from me. Uh, what we've got on the top there, top left, is uh, we've got um, Neptune. And that's taken over six nights apart. So we've got the movement of Neptune in the sky over the course of six nights on the 8th of the 10th and the uh, 2nd of the 10th. So that's its motion through the sky over those nights. And one of those shots I took with the uh, two times Barlow. And down the bottom there, you can see um, uh, that's Neptune there. And you can see Triton right next to it in the little corner there. So I managed to get Neptune and uh, Triton in that shot. Nerade is also somewhere in that shot, but I couldn't make it out. I tried Sky Safari to see where it was supposed to be and couldn't see it. It's much fainter, so missed that one. But I did get Triton, which I'm happy about. And the other one is um, Saturn through my telescope, which is an 80 mil refractor uh, with a five times power mate, which makes a focal length of around about two and a half meters. And I also stacked a 20 mil Plossel into that. So with the power mate and a 20 mil Plossel and then an eyepiece projection 
tube to get um, to get that image, which I again video, extract the frames, stack them, and process them to to give that that final product. Um, now I've got a couple of nice shots here from uh, Russell Smith again. Uh, so that's Saturn again from last night, and there was pretty good um, pretty good seeing last night. So Saturn also had. Sorry, Russell also had another photo from a few nights ago, but he asked me to show this one instead. It's a bit clearer. Uh, the other one down the bottom is from the 7th or the 10th, and he's just increased the exposure on that and the contrast, and you can actually make out uh, three of Saturn's moons. There's one around about there, if you can just make that out, just above the ring. The other one there and the other one there. And those three moons are, uh, what does he say? Enceladus, Tethys, and Rhea. So that's Enceladus up there. Tethys down there and Rhea down there. Uh, next we've got some really nice shots from uh, Dominic Lucarelli as well. Um, Saturn of uh, Saturn on the 22nd and the 23rd of the 9th. Uh, the bottom one I'll go through first. That's um, just a color image, ASI 485 color camera with his C14 Celestron. So it's a 14 inch Celestron. And the top image is a uh, taken with an infrared filter, uh, so you're able to get a lot more contrast and a lot more detail on um, on the uh, atmosphere of Saturn using the infrared filter. Infrared light comes through a lot more stable through the atmosphere, so able to get a lot more detail. Now, there's one thing that I noticed on this photo, which I pointed out to my wife, and she said I was seeing things, but there's a certain feature on Saturn that um, is sort of iconic of Saturn now. We've seen it through the Cassini photos. Does anyone know what I'm talking about that you can sort of make out in that photo or am I imagining it? Yes. Can you see it there? See, I, I reckon I could see it as well and my wife thought I was crazy. But um, up the top, Hexagon has got a hexagonal shaped um, pattern on its uh, sitting over its pole. And I reckon that that there, the, the straight edges there, that outline that um, polar hexagon. So I don't know, you might agree with me, you might not. But I reckon I can see it and I reckon I'm not crazy. So, um, Yeah, so some great photos there by, um, by Dominic too. So thanks Dominic. So I've got some really gifted planetary photographers. Uh, next month, okay, uh, Halloween's coming up. So uh, Peter Wiley suggested we do Spooky Astro. Uh, Basically anything that you photograph in the sky that you think has got a bit of a Hall uh, Halloween feel to it the full moon you could get someone howling at that or ghostly looking nebulas or Spiders and webs and witches snakes, whatever you think you can find that's got a bit of a Halloween theme to it uh, Take a photo of it and that'll be our, our next uh, challenge. This is the witch head nebula which I photographed earlier this year But that's in Orion and it rises a little bit late. So you might not be able to to get that one, so send your photos uh, in there, either to Facebook, eScorpius, or email them directly to me. Um, now, another exciting announcement, uh, MPAS is getting an astrophotography group. So um, it's uh, starting it off on uh, eScorpius, it's a new eScorpius group uh, focused on astrophotography. So anyone, any member who's interested in astrophotography, you don't have to be an astrophotographer, but if you're interested to know how these photos are taken and what's involved, want to discuss equipment, processing techniques, um, get feedback on your images, how to improve them or anything else, uh, gives us an opportunity to just, you know, tap into the wealth of knowledge that exists in our MPAS membership and um, um, get some feedback and improve our photography and just discuss anything astrophotography. So uh, we don't have to spam everyone who's not interested in astrophotography on the, on the main members uh, forum. So anyone can join up, um, no extra cost. Uh, and um, yeah, we discuss our images. Now the idea of the AP group is basically for people to post images with the purpose of getting feedback on them. So if you don't want to get uh, feedback on your images, um, don't post them. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's not uh, it, finished images, a nice finished image that you've taken, you can post it to the main, the main group, but if there's, you're working on something, you want to get some ideas for it, how to improve it, how to take it better, that's what this group here is for. 
Okay, so uh, oh, also you'll be able to join that up through eScorpius and we'll put out a message on eScorpius with a link where anybody can, um, can click on it and join the AP group. Okay, that's me for this month. Any questions? Nope. Terrific. Sky for the month. Um, so I'm always using the, the cover image for the monthly um, article that Nerida writes for the Modern Peninsula magazine. So we always have really nice photos in there. And so I'm always using those. And this month's was by Nick. Very spooky looking. Spooky looking. That, that is actually a very spooky looking image. That's right. All right, let's start with um, a look at the solar system. For, for this month, so um, the inner planets, including ourselves, um, look like this, uh, similar to last month, but we, we basically have um, our Earth here, and so you can see Venus um, is over here, Mercury is coming, coming back from behind the Sun, and Mars is basically um, behind the Sun now. So that, that gives, already gives you an idea of what's actually visible at the moment, what isn't. If we zoom out a bit from there, um, and, and look at the outer planets. Um, again, that looks very similar to last month as well, because they don't move that quickly, but of course we do. Um, but you can still see that, that Jupiter is um, kind of in, in that direction. Ju Jupiter and, and um, Uranus are almost aligned in that direction, and Saturn and Neptune are kind of in, in, the, in the other direction. But we are now kind of speeding away from them, and we'll see that um, in a bit when we look at the in the uh, at the individual planets. All right, so with, with these slides, unfortunately, I, I couldn't get the descriptions to line up properly, but we'll see. So the first planet we'll look at is Mars. And as you could see um, on the overview before, Mars is basically disappearing behind the sun at the moment. Um, so this is on the 1st of November. And um, while zooming in, you can still see the sun around there. So it's very close to the sun now. It'll disappear behind the sun, so it'll go into conjunction with the sun on the 18th of November. And then it will really only reappear for us to be visible in, um, I think, late January or something like that um, next year. Um, and then um, basically will reappear from, from behind the sun and then will be visible again. But um, yeah, we'll have to wait quite a bit um, to see Mars again. Um, and that also means that all of the current rovers on Mars will disappear behind the sun, so NASA will lose all connections with them for about a couple of weeks or so. Um, so all of, all of the research that's going on around Mars at the moment will basically um, stop for a, for a week. Um, if we continue from Mars to Mercury, um, so I have to zoom out a bit. Um, Mercury is also quite close to the sun, right? So it's, it's in the same direction, but um, it now returns um, to the evening sky. So it was in conjunction in October. I'm not sure if it's, if it's still, if, if, if it already happened or um, will be in a couple of days or so, but anyway, it'll, it'll reappear um, to, the, to the evening sky uh, after its conjunction and um, then will be visible um, again a bit later in November. And the next thing I thought, we, we have a quick look at Psyche, just because, um, as, as Peter mentioned, there was this, this mission. So Psyche um, is, was the 16th minor planet that was actually discovered, so discovered quite a while ago in 1852. Um, and it's magnitude 9 to 12. So I'm actually wondering whether we could try and take a photo. Right? Mag magnitude 9 to 12 doesn't seem <laughs> too crazy to, to just try and image it. Um, I think that, that could be a fun target to, to try. Um, and yeah, so that's, that's definitely visible at the moment, so we could actually give that a try if we wanted to. I'm not sure if that's spooky enough for the challenge. <laughs> the name sounds a bit spooky, I think, but anyway. <laughs> um, okay, but let's look at the gas giants. So um, Jupiter is now, um, very close to opposition. Uh, so the opposition will be on um, the 3rd of November, which means that it's exactly opposite the sun. So a uh, great time to take images because it'll be 
um, high in the sky and very bright and the closest to us um, in its, its orbit. So you can see, well, this is now again on the 1st of November, but a bit later, um, around midnight. Um, so yeah, it'll be um, a very good opportunity to, uh, to take images of, of Jupiter um, around this time. And, um, and that, that'll stay like that for, for the next um, few months. So um, yeah, hopefully we'll get a few more um, a bit clearer images than the ones that, that are kind of low in the sky and, and through the haze and so on. And it, it'll be good for our public nights um, to be able to show people um, Jupiter. Of course, the other really nice target for public nights is Saturn. So um, Saturn was um, at opposition um, a few weeks ago, which means that it's now already quite high in the sky at sunset. Um, and um, it's still magnitude 0 0.8, so still nice and bright, easy to find, um, and probably still a pretty good target. Um, but it um, will now start, well, it, it'll rise uh, well before sunset now, and so it's already very high up in the sky at sunset, and then um, it'll be, well, it'll, it'll get closer to the horizon at sunset um, as the months go on. Um, and on the 23rd of November, it'll be at its eastern quadrature, which means that it's basically at a 90 degree angle to Earth. And what that means is that it casts the maximum shadow on its rings. So that might be a nice thing um, to observe around that time, right? So where you can see the, the planet itself casting a shadow on the ring system. Um, and that shadow is, is kind of the biggest because uh, on the 23rd of November, because we've, we've got this 90 degree angle with, with Saturn. Um, it'll also be close to the moon on the 20th of um, November, which I think, is that Vastrock? Our 25th is Vastrock, okay, yeah. All right, Uranus is um, in a similar part of the sky as, as Saturn. It's also coming up for opposition, so uh, again, we'll be exactly opposite um, the sun from us, so high in the sky um, at night and um, closest to Earth, but still only magnitude 5.6 and um, quite a small diameter of uh, just four arc seconds. Um, but yeah, definitely visible through, through our telescopes here or um, easy to image at, at this time because it's um, relatively close to Earth um, in, in, in the orbit. And finally, Neptune is a bit fainter than Uranus, only magnitude around eight um, and smaller. It'll be within one degree of the moon on the 22nd of um, November, but then because it's quite small and faint, that, that's probably not, not such an interesting target if it's still one degree away. Um, but yeah, Neptune is, is, is never such an interesting target, I guess. But uh, Neptune was the one that we didn't have an image of, is that right? Uranus was, was oh, okay, that's, that's interesting. Because that should actually be, hmm? You've got Neptune, yes. That's, yes, that's a bit surprising, but okay, we'll see. And then finally, the moon. Um, so if you're going for the, for the spooky moon images for this month's challenge, um, your opportunity is on the 29th of October. Um, and then we'll have a new moon on the 13th of November and again a full moon on the uh, 22nd of November. Um, I'm not sure. I think because this was on the 1st of November, um, I had to wait until around 2 a.m. To, um, <laughs> to, to show where, where it is in the sky on, on that day. All right, quick look at um, the um, relative sizes of the planets, the relative apparent sizes on... Um, and again, I should fix this on the 1st of November, not the 1st of October. Um, yeah, you can see Venus and, and, and Jupiter um, are, are still quite large, um, and, and Saturn is um, um, getting a bit smaller now that we've passed opposition. And I missed Venus in the, in the previous ones. Um, I don't know why I missed Venus. <laughs> Uh, but um, 
Venus is not in conjunction at the moment, so it's definitely visible, um, but still a morning object at the moment. Yeah. Okay, so um, comments, there's, there's a few comments, but I'm, as far as I could find, there's, there's nothing really interesting at the moment. So they're, they're all kind of, um, I don't know, either somewhere in the north where we can't see them or um, like setting shortly after sunset or um, very faint fading to magnitude 11 to 12 and things like that. So it's, it's not, not a really exciting time for comets at the moment. But the list is here in case you're, um, you're interested in, uh, in looking at some of them. And then we have some uh, meteor sh uh, showers coming up. So the northern uh, torrids are from um, the 20th of October till the 10th of December, peaking um, around the 13th of November, which is the new moon. So that should be um, uh, nice to actually um, view them. And they, they are visible from late evening to early morning and apparently frequently bright, slow moving and may produce fireballs. And then we have the Leonids from the 6th of November till the 30th of November with a peak on the 18th. Um, again, which is um, not that long after the new moon, so that, that shouldn't be impacted by, by, the, by the moon at that time. So um, they're, they're probably one of the, one of the better meteor showers um, to view. And for those, you'd have to uh, wait until after midnight to see them because Leo is um, only rising after midnight. And yeah, with, with these, um, with the names, the names indicate where they appear to come from, like which constellation they appear to come from. So let's have a look at the constellations. Um, this is the southern sky on the 1st of November. Um, so we can see, and this is around 7.30 p.m. So that's probably even still before. Ah, oh, yeah, you can still see the sun over there. So just, just before sunset. Um, if we then fast forward a bit, um, you can see the, the Milky Way um, quite low over there. But um, Features like the small Magellanic Cloud um, is still nice, nice and high in the sky around this time of the year. You can see Canopus and Sirius rising again even before midnight now, um, and uh, we can even see um, Orion rise up there. And uh, yeah, most of the the targets of the uh, of, of the Milky Way are probably a bit low in the sky. And then if we move to the northern sky. Um, at, uh, well, just after sunset, you can see Jupiter and Saturn quite high in the sky there. Uh, we've got Andromeda down here, but the, yeah, the Andromeda galaxy um, just above the horizon, so um, visible in theory, but probably not really that interesting to look at from, from around here. Um, and again, we can now see um, uh, Sirius and, um, and Orion um, rise again at a, at a reasonable time, so that is a clear indication that we're heading towards um, towards summer now. And I was trying to see, um, um, where do we have Taurus? That should come into view, right? There's, there's Taurus for the uh, Taurid uh, meteor showers. And then um, this is midnight now. Uh, you, you can see you can see roughly that that it's relatively low in the in the northern sky there. But um, as long as there's no moon around, that that might still be uh, interesting to look at. All right, and I think yeah, and that, there's Venus, right? So morning object now. And there's there's Leo up there, <laughs> uh, where the Leonids will um, appear to come from. But this is in the morning, yeah. So you have to wait until after midnight to see that. And um, that's Sky for the Month. So the sources are the um, Stellarium um, software, NASA's Eyes on the Solar System, and the Astronomy 2023 uh, three Almanac. All right. Any questions? OK. Uh, just before I start tonight, um, 
you would have received a second of our podcast we've sent out. Um, uh, we did our first podcast with Professor Lasky. Um, our second one went out today. This is Rowena Nathan. She is a PhD candidate at Monash and studying, interestingly enough, the rotation timing um, of certain particular objects in the sky. And uh, a very interesting young lady. She's pretty young to be doing a PhD. And I'm, I was very impressed with her when we interviewed her. She was fantastic. Our next uh, podcast coming up is Professor Randall Wyeth. Um, not many people know Randall very well, but if you knew the Murchison array in Western Australia, he was the original engineer and astrophysicist that designed the whole array, which is about 400 kilometres west of the actual border, or not the border, the sea in the top of Western Australia. And um, it's, it's really a combination of many different investors that have invested in it. And he's about to be interviewed, I think, in about two weeks' time. And our fourth, um, our fourth uh, podcast this year is with uh, a Dr. Yevgeny. Um, he was at Monash, but uh, we can't get him to sign off legally to send out the podcast because he's back in Israel in the war. So <laughs> he's disappeared from Australia and from Monash at this stage, not available until probably the war is over. So we hope he's going to be safe and he returns to Monash to continue his research. A very interesting guy. So that's our podcast for the year. We're planning eight next year. Uh, podcasts of different Australian researchers. Um, some of them will be from Queensland, some from Victoria, and we hope from some from Western Australia again. So I've got to say this is one of the hardest projects I've ever tried to do. Um, doing podcasts with astrophysicists. Um, um, if you ever try to do a podcast with um, astronomers or astrophysicists and even cosmologists, um, they can be a little bit difficult to work with. Uh, however, I do say um, Randall Wyeth has been an absolute gentleman. He's fantastic. So there's all sorts of people in this world. Okay, I thought I'd just do a very quick um, rundown of sound in the Big Bang. And uh, does anyone know, just as a quick quiz here, can you, hear, can you hear sound or can sound propagate in Jupiter? Anyone know? Okay, you think so? What about in the, our sun? Can sound propagate in our sun? Difficult questions. What about inside a black hole? You have to think about that one. <laughs> what was that, Gwyneth? Well, inside, if, if you fell into a black hole and I fell in afterwards and you screamed out, I'm, be I'm becoming spaghettified, would I hear it? Something. And inside space, is, is there sound inside space? <laughs> That's right. Well, sound inside Jupiter, definitely yes, because of the environment and the ability for waveforms to actually travel through that atmosphere. And it's metallic hydrogen that allows the sound to, sound to actually propagate. And it propagates around about 36 kilometres per second, which is interesting. Um, inside the sun, absolutely yes again. Um, uh, of course, you're talking about high energy plasma inside the core of roughly 15 million degrees or even, even more. Um, inside a black hole, um, when you look at the literature, some say yes, some say no. Um, it's possible but it's on the condition of what type of black hole, because there's about four different types of black holes. So um, I think you just have to say it, it's possible. That's, that's all we could really say about that. Inside space, it's absolutely a no, because there's no air or there's no water for that to happen. So when you, when you talk to uh, astrophysicists, um, according, I have some dialogue with uh, Dan Hooper now and again. He's, he's very good with his time. Um, he said the Big Bang was like an, an, it wasn't like an ear splitting sound if you screamed out or something that we would hear in our, fre our audible uh, frequency. He describes it as a robotic low humming, like a mmm. And has anyone actually tapped on the sound of the, uh, sound of the Big Bang? Has anyone heard it? Because I'll show you the, the link that you can actually do. It's quite interesting. Um, it was an inaudible sound because we can't hear it. Um, we're talking about one thousandth of a hertz. This is this is the sound frequency we were talking about. Um, it's a very low frequency, 
sorry, it's one tri trillionth of a hertz. I should correct myself. So it's pretty low. We're here on the 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz band range from a human's point of view. Um, when we look at the higher sounds that, you know, animals on our earth here, a bat would be the probably the highest in the hertz range. And we go all the way down. This is us here. We sort of here between the 20 and 20,000 hertz. Um, we go to dogs here very well. Of course, that's a bigger range than we have, if you look at that. And then we go down to elephants. Elephants um, here sound a very, very low frequency. But the sound we're talking about is way off, off the shelf. So sound propagates basically through vibrations of atoms and molecules, uh, two or more atoms. And it is basically vibrating within air and water. So interestingly enough, uh, does sound move faster in water or air? And what is the big surprise is it moves faster through water. If water is warmer, it even moves farther, faster. If you compare fresh water to salt water, salt water propagates through salt water faster. Um, there's some interesting stuff there we can talk about. Um, but sound travels faster through materials that are stiffer Atoms that are stiffer and lighter mean stiffer meaning atoms that are packed more closely together from a subatomic point of view. And the lowest sound ever recorded, or the large, sorry, the highest sound ever recorded is volcanoes on the earth. That's the loudest sound we hear. But we can actually hear it with our ears. That's an interesting thing. When we look at um, the speed of, you know, wh what is the, the speed of sound? It's about 767 miles an hour miles an hour and that's got to be at 20 20 degrees celsius or what we call room temperature um, that's called mach 1 um, we've obviously seen on videos this this sound barrier that happens behind a jet plane it's it's not a, it's not actually a barrier itself it's not a physical solid barrier it's going through but that creates a, son, a sonic boom when that happens so why can't sound itself travel through space of course, we know space is a vacuum. Now, if we took a square box of uh, space, um, it would be devoid. And if we sucked all the air out or we just took a square box of space out on the ISS, um, we would have, but you would see nothing in it. But what's inside space is quite remarkable. You'll have cosmic microwave background radiation going through it. You'll have sun's radiation going through it. You'll have gamma radi radiation going through it. You'll have a lot of things, but what's not there is air to actually propagate the sound. So basically space is not a void of stuff. It, it really has nothing there. It needs water or air to actually propagate the sound. Even if a supernova went off and that's the loudest um, explosion in our universe we know of, you wouldn't hear it, it'd be silent. Okay, if you're on the ISS, of course, when you, you're up in space, yes, but why are you hearing in space inside that capsule? It's because of actual room temperature air is in there allowing sound to actually vibrate through to get to the other people in it. But if they go out into on a spacewalk, the only way they can talk is through an electronic communication system. Um, I looked up some people that talk about sound a lot and the sound of the Big Bang. And what the name came up, John Carr, I actually don't know this guy very well, but he's in the University of Washington. Um, he's, um, he also conferred with um, other physicists saying that sound itself has a hum or a bang. It's like a humming sound itself. The actual sound came from the Park, uh, Parker probe that was launched in 2006 to 2017 by NASA that took the early pictures of the early universe from about 380 thousand years after the Big Bang and he converted it in and has actually published the sound now. I wish I could actually play it to you tonight because it starts at a very high pitch and works its way down but you can actually go on the internet and listen to it. But sound, eventually the sound waves in this particular audible link starts and then goes away and that's the actual sound of the universe expanding, the cosmological constant expanding the universe pushing out the universe, getting less, less frequencies in the sound, and it eventually fades away around about 400,000 years post Big Bang. And this is the pitch that we're look, looking at, the big pitch like this. When you get a higher pitch, all these sound waves are closer together. But this is the pitch that we're talking about. So we're talking about one trillionth of a hertz, um, literally 
no one, even an elephant would not be able to hear that. It is so low. So, and this is the Planck, this is the Planck probe named after Max Planck from the 1920s. Um, the lowest sound ever recorded on Earth is 20 hertz. We can hear 20 hertz, but you have to have very, very good hearing, okay? Um, and this is the picture taken after the Big Bang occurred at about 400,000 years. So this was, when this picture was taken, the plank was there to record it, but this was at the tail end of the sound itself, not at the beginning of the Big Bang sound. So if you want to go on, um, on the internet and l listen to the audible sound of the Big Bang, you just type in that there, or I can send it out again if you like. But it's worthwhile listening to. You've got to stay there for about five minutes from the time it starts at the top of the pitch till the time it goes right down, down, down until the final part of the pitch. So the end of the, really at the summary, um, um, there was a sound of our Big Bang. And the only reason why there was was because the sound was propagating through um, uh, quark plasma, high energy plasma heat. It was actually going through it like it does with our sun and in Jupiter. Same thing. So thank you. Tonight's feature is uh, how uh, geology began in uh, our solar system. And uh, shown here is uh, Professor Sarah uh, Russell. This is care of the uh, Geological Society uh, of London. Um, aside from uh, working at the Natural History Museum in London, I imagine some of you have uh, also been to the Natural History Museum. Uh, they have a wonderful collection of meteorites there. Um, she's also on the OSIRIS-REx mission, which is the one that went to Bennu, and also the uh, Hayabusa uh, one that uh, went to uh, Ryugyu. And she has an asteroid named after her as well, number uh, 5,497. Okay, so my name's Sarah Russell. I'm from the Natural History Museum, where I uh, study the formation of the solar system using our fantastic collection of meteorites as a tool. I'll tell you a little bit about that as we go through the talk. Um, and I just want to say I'm really delighted to be part of this Geological Society Year of Space. And I'm really looking forward to all the other talks that are going to happen in this series as well. Um, so just since I'm the first talk uh, of this series, I'm going to introduce you first to our solar system. So, of course, the most by far the most massive object in our solar system is our sun in the centre of our solar system. So this is a, a ball of hydrogen and helium that's actually creating new elements in its center by hydrogen fusion. Um, and then surrounding um, the sun are the planets. The innermost one is Mercury, which is going to be the subject, I think, of next uh, month's talk. Uh, and then, oh, uh, and then Venus, the Earth's evil twin that's almost the same size as, as the Earth, but which has this runaway um, greenhouse um, gas causing its surface to get very hot. Then our planet, the Earth, and its unique moon, which is also going to be a subject of one of the talks in this series. Uh, and that is Mars. So you may have heard Mars is super in the news at the moment. So uh, yesterday, uh, a spacecraft from the UAE actually went into orbit around Mars. And today, another spacecraft from China uh, went uh, arrived at Mars as well. And next week, uh, a NASA um, mission is uh, Mars 2020 is going to land on the surface of Mars. So it's a super exciting time for, for Mars scientists right now. Uh, outwards from Mars, we reach the asteroid belt, which is um, a belt of small rocky bodies. And uh, it doesn't really look like this. It looks like this in sci-fi movies, but actually it's a lot less dense and more spread out in, in real life. So um, asteroids are about a kilometre across. They are uh, a million miles or two away from each other in the asteroid belt. Uh, and then comes Jupiter, the largest planet in our solar system uh, and its many moons. Then beautiful Saturn, of course, and its lovely rings. Uh, and then finally, Uranus and Neptune. So these outer planets all possibly have uh, diamonds raining down in their interiors. So they're really exciting places. So these are the planets in our solar system. OK, so just to give you an idea of scale of our solar system, here there's an image of 
the innermost parts of the solar system. So that is the four rocky planets. Uh, that is uh, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, the asteroid belt, and Jupiter. Uh, but you'll see this innermost part of the solar system is really only a tiny part of the whole solar system if you look at the uh, larger planets as well. And then our dwarf planet Pluto on the outside. Um, maybe you thought I'd forgotten about Pluto. I hadn't really. Um, but Pluto isn't considered a planet anymore because we know there are other objects that are kind of similar in size to Pluto also in our solar system. So one example is Sedna, which is, is shown uh, here outside the orbit of Pluto. And if we, if we look out again at, at uh, the orbit of Sedna, you see it has a massive journey around the solar system. So at the moment, it's fairly close to um, uh, the sun relative for for its orbit, but it can go really far out away from the sun. Uh, and even Sedna is not uh, where the solar system ends. So surrounding our solar system is a shell of icy bodies called the Oort cloud, which are bodies that are only very loosely gravitationally attached to our solar system, but they make our whole solar system absolutely massive. So now I'm gonna talk a little bit about the great galactic cycle of stars and how stars are formed. Uh, so the solar system start, well, I'll, I'll, I'll start back, back, back with the start of the universe. The universe started with a, with a big bang about 13.8 billion years ago. And that produced a load of hydrogen, helium, a little bit of lithium. Um, and so this was just this cloud of gas that was produced. And in some places it became a little bit denser and in those places, it could start to collapse under the force of its own gravity. So once, once it, it started getting denser, then this, this kind of went to um, kind of extremes that it um, managed to shrink down to form eventually a star. Um, the star surrounded by a disk of material. And um, in some cases, this disk of material can then go on to form the planets. The disk feeds the star and makes it bigger and bigger, and the stuff left over can form the planets. At the end of the star's life, then uh, it gives out all of the elements that it's been making while it's been burning back into, the, uh, into space, which is called the interstellar medium. So this is either as a red giant star, it will, will let out material as uh, in gentle winds, or it will explode as a supernovae and throw all of its new elements out into space. And then the cycle can start again. And um, so as time goes on, it means that new elements and heavier elements, including the ones that we have here on Earth, all of the carbon that makes our bodies and all of the rock forming elements like silicon and iron that make our planet, as these start to form, uh, in these later generations of stars, uh, so there's more elements available for making planets. Okay, so how are planets made? So um, I'll show you some evidence from various kind of strands of information that means that we, we know basically planets started out from dust and gas, uh, the material that was inside the interstellar medium, and that then was processed while it was in this disk around the star into pebbles and then into planetesimals, into small baby dwarf planets and eventually into fully formed planets. Um, and how can we learn about this process? So there are four main ways, at least four main ways that I'm going to talk about in this talk. First of all, we can make observations of planets that are actually forming around other stars, and we can use that to infer how our own planetary system, the solar system, formed. Secondly, we can look at meteorites. So uh, the meteorites that I'm going to be talking about today are all from asteroids, and these are the oldest known rocks in the solar system, and they're the building blocks of planets. So they form very, very early on in solar system history. I'll talk about their ages a bit more in a while. Um, also, we can look at planet formation using computer simulations. So um, we can write computer code to create tiny particles in a computer. We can tell the computer how big they are, how fast they're moving, how they're gravitationally attracted to each other, and then wait and let the program run and see 
what is produced during uh, that kind of simulation. And finally, we can actually go on space missions to explore uh, these asteroids that we think are ancient relics of our solar system. Okay, so to start off with planet observations, um, so over the last uh, few decades, there's been an amazing amount of new information about how planets form around other stars. And it started off here with the Hubble Space Telescope. So this is an image of the Orion Nebula, which is a stellar nursery. It's a place where new stars are forming. Uh, and these little squares are uh, close-up pictures of actual stars that are forming. And you can see that most of them have these, these dusty um, envelopes around them, which are the protoplanetary disks from which the planets will, will form. So then later generation telescopes like uh, ALMA, in the Atacama um, can image uh, this planet formation at even higher resolution. So this is one of the ALMA images. So ALMA lo is looking at the distribution of dust around a star. Um, and it shows, this image shows a star in the center surrounded by rings of dust. And the gaps in the rings are actually quite interesting. We think these might be where planets are starting to form as a planet forms and it plows an orbit around its star, it is like one of those uh, mechanical uh, vacuum cleaners and it sweeps up all of the dust that's in its path. And so it forms gaps in these dust rings. Uh, there's another image here, a more recent image from also from ALMA. And uh, this uh, is thought to perhaps have uh, formed these gaps in the rings, perhaps from from the movement around, in and out of a single planet. Okay, so as well as seeing planets in the process of forming from these dust ring galaxy have also shown there are actually already formed planetary systems in, uh, uh, oh, sorry, I'm getting an error message. I hope you can all hear me. Um, so uh, we can also see there are actual planetary systems around other stars. And this is such an amazing development. When, when I started in science, there were no known planets around other stars. When I started in science, there were nine planets and they were all in our solar system. And now there's only eight in our solar system, but there's thousands um, around other stars. Uh, so most of these have been observed by this space mission called Kepler. So Kepler is actually a space telescope and it has the sole function of trying to look for planets and especially earth type planets uh, and it does this by staring at a star and seeing if the star dims because a planet is moving across the front of the star and from that you can work out um, how big they are and how far away they are from their star. So this way Kepler has found over 2500 different planetary systems, found planets of all shapes and sizes uh, and found systems that have multiple planets orbiting around one star as well. So this suggests that our solar system is not particularly special in our galaxy. But next I'm gonna go uh, on to talk about meteorites and what they can tell us about the formation of our own solar system. Excuse me. So meteorite, a type of meteorite called chondrites formed in the very earliest part of the time of the solar system. These are pieces of asteroid that just accumulated the material from the protoplanetary dust, the disk uh, that was around our early sun. And if we look at a chondrite in detail, we can see it has several features. The most common of these are called chondrules. They're rounded objects. They can be brownish or darkish. Sometimes they're a bit lighter in color, but they're usually round in shape. And then also we find things called calcium aluminium rich inclusions or CAIs, which are more irregular in shape and they, they're always white in color. And these two things I'm going to compare later on in my talk. Okay, this is a closer up image of a chondrite meteorite. And um, this has a field of view of about one centimeter. Uh, and you can see the round, oh, you can see the rounded chondrules here, for example, and here. And they're surrounded by a fine grain matrix. So we believe these are just cosmic sediments of the material 
that was floating uh, around our early sun. Okay, so another amazing thing about chondrites is their com chemical composition. So if you measure the abundance of all the elements in chondrites that you possibly can, um, and then you compare it to measurements of the solar photosphere, which is the outermost layer of the sun that's most visible to us, then you can see for nearly all elements, there's a fantastic correlation. So they have the same abundance in both these meteorites and in the sun, except for hydrogen and helium, which of course are by far the most abundant elements in the sun. You have to take those out because otherwise it wouldn't be fair to compare it. Um, so this tells us that the chondrites and therefore asteroids and therefore all of the rocky stuff in the solar system actually does have a has a genetic connection to our sun, that it was formed from the same initial material, the same cloud of material. And looking in a little bit more detail now uh, at CAIs and chondrules. So these are objects that form separately within the protoplanetary disk, but they have slightly different textures. So CAIs um, can be melted, but most of them uh, were never melted. They have a fluffy texture. They're a little bit like snowflakes, which are also condensates, very, very porous. And we think they form from uh, the solidification of a very hot gas. So it was a hot gas so, uh, cooled down and the elements went directly from being in a gaseous form to being in a solid form. And then in contrast, chondrules are much more compact. They're, they're always spherical uh, and they've all, all of them show signs of having been melted. So these were liquid droplets in our protoplanetary disk. And I should probably say at this point that it's one of the great mysteries of meteoritics that we don't actually know exactly uh, what the heat source was that formed chondrules. We don't really understand very well how they formed, but we do know that there, there was hot little tiny little things were floating around um, in this protoplanetary disk at the beginning of the solar system. And in between the chondrules and CAIs is a fine grained matrix. And the matrix is has made of tiny, tiny little particles um, that are less than one micron, that's a millionth of a meter uh, big. Most of it is not properly crystalline, but it's got little bits of chondrules in it. Uh, and it also has quite a lot of organic material in it, which might actually help the whole meteorite stick together and therefore the whole asteroid stick together. Um, so it may play a role in being a, a glue for the whole object to form. So the next thing I'm going to talk about is the age of these objects. And um, if you know anything about meteorites already, you'll know that these are really, really old. And, and sometimes it gets a bit boring saying, oh, this object's really old. Oh, that one's really old too. Oh, that one's really old too. So uh, this slide, I'll, I'll take a bit of time on. It's maybe a little bit complicated, um, partly because of my very poor um, drawing skills. Uh, so in this diagram, the blue and pink weird look shaped things, my son said they look like popcorn, are actually the CAIs. Um, and the chondrules are these rounded objects here. And the time absolute time scale is here. And the absolute time scale is calibrated by Martin Bizarro and his group. Um, so this is one of the seminal publications about this. Um, but other publications uh, like uh, this one I was involved in kind of agree with this kind of broad outline. And these data suggest that CAIs always are the oldest objects that we measure. And this is all using uh, lead isotope dating. So uh, an element uranium is radioactive and it decays to the element lead. And by looking at how much radiogenic lead, that is lead that has been produced by decay of uranium, has built up in these rocks, we can measure how old they are. Uh, the CAIs are always uh, between 4567 and 4568 million years. And these have been measured really precisely with less than a million years uh, error bar. And the chondrules, in contrast, have a range of ages. Some of them do seem to be as old as the CAIs, but some of them are several million years younger. Uh, but none of them are, super mu are, are more than around five million years younger than CAIs. And that makes us think that these objects were forming in our protoplanetary disk within about five million years or so, 
And up to that time, probably most of the dust in the protoplanetary disk had cleared. So there weren't any chondrules floating around anymore. They'd all been swept up to make um, asteroids and planets. And so we think this will map on to, if we look at the big scale view, this maps onto uh, star evolution uh, in this way. So the CAI is formed right at the beginning of solar system history when the star was really just beginning to collapse and form. Uh, the chondrules formed when there was a, a dusty disk around the star and then they stopped forming when the protoplanetary disk started to really clear out except for the outermost portion which would make uh, the Kuiper belt and the Oort cloud. Okay so now I want to move on to the next process of planet formation once you've cleared your disk and, and made asteroid sized objects and the next stage is to uh, undergo a process which is called differentiation. So a lot of these objects, when they formed, they contained radioactive isotopes, and that meant that they would get pretty hot, and hot enough, in fact, to melt. And as they melted, the denser elements, like iron, would sink down to form a core, and the lighter elements, like silicon, magnesium, would um, go upwards to form a mantle, uh, and then, uh, during more evolution, a thin crust would, would also form. And this process is called differentiation, and all of the inner planets have, have undergone this process. And it's because of differentiation that we live on a planet that has a magnetic field with an iron-rich core. So we can't actually sample our own Earth's core, but we can get an idea of what it might be like by looking at meteorites. Some meteorites, not chondrites, some, but other meteorites have melted, and these are samples of asteroids that can tell us about the differentiation process. Um, so many meteorites are made mostly of iron, and they probably represent the core of a large asteroid that got um, disrupted. Um, some meteorites uh, represent mantle material, um, and some represent crustal material. And then there are some meteorites that may come from the boundary between the core and the mantle because they have both iron and they have silicate in them as well, which we expect from the mantle. Okay, so getting asteroid-sized objects then into planets is the next stage of planet formation. And once an asteroid or planet, planetesimal, a small baby planet, is uh, more than about a kilometer or so in size, then it will undergo a process called runaway growth. And that's because it will start to have its own gravity and um, objects that are flying around the solar system nearby will smash into it and ultimately will allow it to grow. Um, and by looking at this process of runaway growth, uh, we can, uh, well, people that look, make computer simulations can look at how the solar system formed. Uh, so this is the simulation by John Chambers, and it starts off with a bunch of small uh, objects, which uh, we call asteroids or planetesimals, and he sees what happens if they're allowed to smash into each other just from the forces of gravity. Um, so here on the, on the x-axis is the distance from the sun, um, where 1 AU is the distance between the Earth and the sun. And so let's have a look at the, how the simulation goes. We start, these objects start to get bigger and bigger, so they move upwards on this graph, and you end up with four planets, which frankly look very much like our solar system. So this could be Mercury, Venus, Earth, and finally Mars. So it is possible to make our solar system uh, just assuming that it grows through this process of, of gravity attracting these larger objects to each other and by colliding with each other. But people that run computer simulations have taught us something else as well, and that is that the planets can actually move around and migrate. Uh, and this is one example, which is called the Nice model, but there are other models um, that have, have been published separately. And the Nice model suggests that in the earliest times of the solar system, all the planets were very scrunched up. They were very compact and quite close to the parent star. And then, the larger planets started to get into a resonance with each other. They started to um, interact with each other in a way that actually meant they got thrown outwards. And in this particular simulation, actually there's an extra planet in our solar system that actually gets thrown out during this process. So I think it's about to start again now. So it starts here 
very compact solar system and there's lots of tiny icy bodies around the outside that haven't um, managed to um, uh, accrete into a planet. But during the migration, these small icy objects get thrown into the inner solar system, which is good for us because it makes them into asteroids that we can then sample. So um, we can actually go and see these asteroids as well as just waiting for them to fall to Earth as meteorites. And there are three space missions so far that have successfully gone to an asteroid that's near Earth and brought material back. Um, well, or is in the process of bringing material back. Um, so the first two are Japanese missions, which are now returned to Earth. These are Hayabusa and Hayabusa 2. Uh, Hayabusa actually just came back in December 2020, very recently. Um, Hayabusa 1 visited an S-type asteroid, which is a very uh, stony asteroid. And Hayabusa 2 is uh, visited a different sort of asteroid called the C-type asteroid, which we think is richer in carbon. And then NASA have also have an asteroid return mission in progress, uh, which called the Cyrus Rex, which launched in 2016, and um, which is visiting a different type of asteroid again, but it's related to the C-type carbon-rich asteroid. Um, so these are really exciting missions for people who are studying planet formation because we believe that asteroids, particularly like the target of Hayabusa 2 and Osiris Rex, are really the building blocks of uh, the planets in our solar system and can tell us about this process of solar system formation. Okay, so I'm going to talk about Osiris Rex first, which is a mission that I've been um, involved in for longer. So it launched in 2016. And then it went uh, around the sun and a year later it came close to the earth again and its gravitational interaction with the earth meant that it could get uh, kind of catapulted into a different direction called the slingshot, catapulted towards um, its target asteroid, which is called Bennu. Um, it collected a sample on the surface of Bennu a couple of months ago in October 2020 and it's due to come back to earth in 2023. Um, so I was lucky enough to watch it launch in Cape Canaveral in the US, so I'll have to show everyone my pictures. So this is a picture of the launch. This is it going into the skies, the last time the science team actually saw the spacecraft. Um, and then this is all, all of us watching around the, uh, watching the, the launch of the object. So first of all, I'm going to tell you why we um, study uh, why we chose the asteroid Bennu as the target of the Cyrus Rex um, mission. Uh, and it would seem like there's lots of asteroids to choose from because there's over 500,000 asteroids, but many more, probably millions of asteroids in the solar system. But of those, only just over 7,000 are near Earth, so are, are fairly accessible to us. Um, and of those, only 192 of the right sort of orbit that they are easily to, easy to get to from uh, by spacecraft. Of those, most of them are really tiny and only uh, 26 got diameter more than, I think that should be 200 meters. Uh, and of those, only five are ice and carbon rich. And these are the ones that we're really interested in. Um, so ones that are ice and carbon rich, firstly, probably originated very much in the outer part of the solar system. And in that part of the solar system, they were less affected by heat of the sun. And so they'll preserve more of the material um, of the primordial interstellar cloud that the solar system was made from. And also these objects that are rich in ice and carbon are important because they might have um, provided water and carbon to the earth. They might have provided the ingredients that we need for life to flourish and for Earth to become a habitable planet. Okay, so this is a picture of um, the Bennu asteroid. And uh, one of the surprises of the mission is that it um, obviously contains quite a diverse lot of rocks. It was a lot more um, diverse than, than was expected. You can see there are some darker boulders there and some lighter boulders. The lighter boulders might have carbonate in them. Um, and uh, it also has this distinctive diamond type shape, which is probably because it's a, it's a rubble pile. It has quite a high porosity and it's probably just a stack of boulders and stones kind of loosely stuck together. Uh, and because it's spinning around, uh, something like that will naturally form this kind of diamond shape. 
Um, so the um, science team mapped the whole surface of Bennu very carefully uh, and chose where they would like to sample it. Um, they have, so they have this opportunity to sample it and bring material back to Earth uh, using this thing called the touch and go sampler. So the touch and go sampler blasts a, a jet of nitrogen gas onto the surface of the um, asteroid. And um, then um, that disrupted the pebbles and, and dust on the surface and allowed it to get captured. Um, so the um, actual capture of sample went really well. Uh, area was chosen called Nightingale that seemed to be particularly rich in this carbon rich stuff that is of interest to everybody. Um, this is what the sampler looked like after the collection. So it's kind of good news, bad news situation. So the good news is there's loads of sample collected. Um, so you can see, um, well, first of all, there are sticky pads, uh, these tiny dots around the outside of the collector are sticky pads that stuck to the surface. And these actually um, collected little pieces of dust of the surface. So there's definitely something that's stuck there. And then inside the collector looks kind of light color before the collection happened. And now it looks dark colored, so it's probably full of material. But the little problem is that um, the collector had this kind of rubbery flap that automatically plopped back down after the collection happened. And um, some little pebbles actually got stuck in the flap, which meant that it didn't close correctly, which means that some pieces, so these white dots here, are all kind of getting a uh, flying out of the collector. <clears throat> so because of that, um, there was a little bit of a change to the operation of the mission. So originally the plan was it, uh, the spacecraft was going to spin round and round really fast. And by doing that, it would be able to tell what the mass inside this collector was. But because it was all spilling out, they decided not to do that and just to stow it away straight away. But they're sure that they have plenty of material anyway. OK, so the other mission I want to talk about is the Japanese mission Hayabusa 2. That's visiting another uh, near Earth asteroid called Rugu. Uh, so, Bennu and Rugu are similar in many ways. They, they're both uh, near Earth asteroids, which means they have a um, distance from the sun similar to that of the Earth. Um, they were both discovered in the same year, about 20 years ago. Um, and uh, in some ways, they're also slightly different. They seem to have a slightly different composition. So that's really great from um, a scientist's point of view, because it means we can compare and contrast the two asteroids. Okay, so this is a GIF of the Hayabusa 2 spacecraft coming towards uh, the asteroid Rugu. Um, so you can see it just starts off as being a tiny dot, and then it's slowly coming clearer and clearer. So you can see straight away, it's the same kind of shape, this diamond shape as Bennu, for the same reason, it's also a rubble pile. You can see it has this large impact uh, crater in it. Um, and um, this is what it looks like. So again, it's covered in boulders. There are some similarities and also differences to Bennu. It's actually seen to be more full of boulders than, than Bennu, which was potentially a problem for the uh, sample collection. Um, which was designed to just collect very tiny fragments of rock, but the collection went fine anyway. Um, so this is a, one of the first pictures of the arrival at Rugu. And this is the mission team at JAXA celebrating uh, the arrival at Rugu. Uh, and this mission has come back, as I mentioned, so it returned to Earth um, in December, just a couple of months ago. Uh, it uh, landed down in the Australian desert. Um, there it is with its little parachute, uh, and it was picked up very carefully. It was found by um, the recovery team very quickly and efficiently, um, taken back to Japan. There were some delays because of the COVID situation. It had to go into quarantine for a while, um, but the team have been able to uh, now open the canister and take a peek inside. Um, so my colleagues and I at the Natural History Museum are um, very eagerly waiting to hear and we're hoping to also analyze some of this material um, and in the meantime we're comparing um, the return sample to uh, the collections of meteorites that we have in in our museum so it looks most similar to a type of chondrite called carbonaceous chondrites um, so there are these are six main types of carbonaceous chondrites 
Um, so these are all examples of ones that we have in our museum collections. Um, and um, so we, we really want to analyze it to find out which, which one it most resembles. So we think maybe it might be similar to the, the CI meteorites, but they may have been heated to be, um, to be uh, turned into a slightly different kind of meteorite, or it may be similar to the CO meteorites, which have these little white dots in them, which are tiny CAIs. Um, so this is work that's gonna happen over the next few months and uh, will be very exciting for us all to, to work on. Okay, so I'm coming towards, uh, so, so in conclusion, we learn about how our solar system formed both by looking at the formation of other planetary systems using these fantastic new generation telescopes. And also we can learn about the formation of our own solar system, which happened four and a half billion years ago, um, using meteorites from asteroids that date from that time and are basically unchanged since the beginning of our solar system. So the very first rocks were created from a disk of dust and gas from which the sun and planets formed. Um, and we know that from both the observational work and also the work on asteroids uh, and the computer simulations as well. Uh, we've got examples of these um, amazing rocks that are from the beginning of the solar system already as meteorites. And we're gonna get more samples from these new generation space missions um, that will be that are active now and will remain active over the next um, few years. So thank you very much for listening. I'm really happy to take any questions and um, yeah, so thank you. Thank you, Sarah. What a fantastic talk. Um, so exciting moving all the way through the solar system. We have lots and lots of questions coming in. Uh, lots chondrules and about uh, chondrites and also a lot about asteroids so I'm going to get started and uh, right. we can answer it on, on the Q&A now. Please keep your questions coming in. So um, how do we know which meteorites represent which component of the Earth's structure? That's one of my questions. Yeah so we know that, uh, um, yeah I could have explained this in a bit more detail and I think you've got a um, talk coming up that's going to cover meteorites in more detail if I'm not mistaken. Um, but we can look at the bulk composition and the texture of meteorites, uh, which tells us this. So, um, so the meteorites that represent core material are made of an alloy of metal, iron nickel metal. And you can see straight away, they're very different to anything that you find on the surface of the earth. Um, they are much denser, they very magnetic. And um, yeah, so I think it's very clear that these are something like material. Uh, and then mantle material, we can compare them to the composition of our Earth's mantle, um, uh, which we have some samples here on Earth. So uh, these contain different minerals, they, they're richer in olivine. Uh, and then the crustal samples, of course, we've got loads of crustal samples on, on Earth, so we can use those as a comparison. They, they tend to be basaltic. Fantastic. Okay. Um... And how do we know that asteroids are ice and carbon rich without actually sampling them? Yeah, well, that's a great question. And um, yeah, I should have maybe gone into that into a bit more detail. So we can say a bit about um, the composition of these objects using a technique called spectroscopy. So that is looking, basically it kind of looks at the color of the asteroid in, in detail and at wavelengths that we don't necessarily see in the visible spectrum. Um, and by comparing um, these measurements of uh, the reflectance of light off the object and also um, how much light they're emitting, you, we can look, we can compare that to the kind of materials that we have on Earth. And these tell us, for example, whether they contain water. So if it contains water, then it has a very distinct feature uh, in its uh, spectrum. So we can say a little bit about this composition um, just using the techniques that we have on Earth and also using um, remote sensing measurements when we're close up to the asteroid. Um, so my, my colleagues at the museum do this and, and also my colleagues at the uh, University of Oxford do this work as well. So well, we can tell quite a lot about things yeah, on the planet without yeah, actually and, going yeah, up to it. Yeah, it's really see, great. Yeah, and you can see if it's carbon rich, these ones tend to be very, very dark. Great. And then this might be a quick one for you. How many samples of meteorites are there at the collections in the museum? Um, there are 
uh, oh, just over 5,000 different meteorites. I think we've got one of the best wow. collections in the world. And uh, so meteorites are divided into finds and falls. So falls are ones that are seen to fall and finds are the ones that are discovered later, either through field trips or just fortuitously. Um, and we've got a great collection of meteorite falls and that's really important because they've been collected very soon after they fell. So they tend to be much fresher and in some ways comparable to the material we'll get back from these space missions. And can you, when the museum is open, can people see the meteorite samples in the exhibitions? Yes, so the museum's closed until um, uh, the beginning of April, probably. Um, and then uh, people can see some meteorites. Uh, so we have this area called the vault at the museum, which has some of our most precious samples. And of course, the meteorites are very precious. Uh, so you can see some, some there. We don't have a exhibition dedicated to meteorites yet, but uh, my colleagues and I really want to have one. That would be great. Um, other qu lots of questions coming in. Um, why did the dense cloud in the galactic stellar cycle move from a cloud to a disk? Do we know? Right, uh, yeah, so it, it started to collapse under its own gravity and it also had angular momentum. So because it has um, a momentum, this, this sort of desire to spin around, it, it tends to flatten out. Um, I'm sure there's an analogy, but I, I can't I can't think of it. But if something's kind of kind of spinny, it has a tendency to 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 try to get flatter as well. So it turns into a kind of disc type shape. Yeah. And with Uma Uma, just forgive me if I've pronounced that incorrectly. Uma. That um, that body that planet Chester, planet, Uma, yeah, the body that they found. Could this be chondritic, or is this likely to be completely different? Do we know? Yeah, so the, so the Woomera uh, sample, so that's the return material from Hayabusa 2. And um, yeah, so we're, we're just about to start analysing it. So my guess would be that it's chondritic. I, Great. Yeah, I uh, so. Do you think that asteroids could contain evidence of life? No, but <laughs> we do know that meteorites <laughs> uh, contain organic material and it can be quite complicated organic material. So. Uh, it can be, you get polyaromatic hydrocarbons, you can get some amino acids, for example, and sugars. So there's quite complicated um, uh, organic molecules in there, but we think that they formed a biogenically, they didn't form by biological processes. So they formed because, um, so carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen are the most common elements, in, among the most common elements in the galaxy, and, and they, bond well to each other so they, they form these these molecules but they these um, although they're not biologically formed they can they're relevant to life in that they might have helped seed uh, the earth with with the materials that that uh, the early earth needed to produce life okay and is it possible that we might find new elements in any of these asteroid samples um, no probably Everyone not wants because to the find periodic table Pardon? Everybody's always excited about finding new elements. <laughs> yeah, I mean the, the periodic table is already kind of quite carefully uh, is quite well defined, and and so I guess any new elements will be super heavy ones that are very unstable, and so uh, they they won't be found in in objects that are are this old, that are billions of years old, because any weird super heavy elements like that would have already decayed. Great. Um, another one. Uh, where do you think the next areas of robotic or crude exploration will take place after the ones that have already been announced? In our solar system, do you mean? Yeah, in our solar system. Oh. Crude or robotic explorations? I, I don't. I don't know. Where would you like to go? I, I tell you where I'd like to go. Yeah, so I would. So, so the um, asteroid sample return missions at the moment have been led by the US and NASA and and the Japanese Space Agency. I'd love to have a European-led asteroid sample return mission because there are loads of people in Europe who are interested in this kind of work. And then my total sort of absolute dream space mission would actually go and get a piece of an interstellar asteroid. So. Uh, over the last few years, there have been a couple of um, kind of interstellar interlopers, the objects that 
sort of asteroids or comets sort of or somewhere in between that have come into the our solar system from somewhere we don't know where some in place beyond our solar system and uh, they're so mysterious i'd love to have a mission to go and explore one of those wow yeah because one of the questions we had is about whether or not there are examples of meteorites from beyond our solar system or galaxy do we know anything yeah. about them and how might they differ yeah, so, so, yeah, so not yet is the answer, but, the, but these uh, kind of observations of these uh, interstellar objects coming into our solar system means that it's, it's, it's possible. And the other thing to say is that inside the fine grained matrix of, of chondrites, you actually get tiny grains of stardust, of, of um, minerals that actually formed in a dying red star or a dying supernova. And these differ from the rest of the material in the meteorite, the rest of the material in the solar system um, from their isotopic composition. They, they match the exact nucleosynthesis, the synthesis of elements that's happening in that particular star. So those are an amazing uh, objects. Incredible. Um, someone has oh, a, big, a question sorry. about... Sorry. <laughs> someone has a <laughs> yeah. question about one of, I think it, probably Bennu, um, you mentioned that it had a big crater and that there were rubble piles. Are these bodies actively changing, breaking up and reforming currently? Yeah, absolutely. Yes, yeah. so I think it, it's Rugu that has this kind of very clearly defined crater on, on its surface. But yeah, but, I mean, they both have craters. They both have craters on them. And that can give you an idea of what the age of the surface is, because um, you can use crater counting, counting how many craters there are and assuming how often it should get impacted to, to work out its age. And what that tells us is, it's, uh, although uh, we think these, these, these rocks are four and a half billion years old, the asteroid they're in now, this rubble pile, is not four and a half billion years old, it's much, much younger. So it's, it has, uh, these, these bodies are continuously um, reforming, um, they're exchanging bits with other asteroids, so that's how they get to have very, diverse compositions on their surface. Um, so yeah, they're always changing. We have some quite a few questions about Mars coming up. Lots of people are probably quite excited about the Perseverance rover landing next week. Um, one question is, um, why does Earth have active tectonics and a magnetosphere, but not Mars? And mm. also, when do you think we might have staffed missions to Mars with people landing on the surface? Yeah, okay, great questions. Probably I'm not the best person to ask about either of these things. Um, so, so Mars is, is um, a bit of a, um, uh, I'm trying to think of a polite way to put this, but it's, it's quite small compared to, to what you might expect from, from the inner solar system. It's much smaller than the Earth. And uh, that could be because of the process of planet migration. It could be because Jupiter came in quite close to where uh, Mars was forming and disrupted its growth and so I, th I think the answer about the tectonics I think it hasn't had quite, it doesn't have quite such a kind of sophisticated geology as as the earth in part because it's smaller but I think a Mars scientist would answer that question a lot better than me and yeah. as to crude, mis crude per person missions to Mars um, you know ever since I started um, my scientific career um, it's always been, I've always been told that, that it's like 10 to 20 years away, and I think that's still the case, but I think we are sort of, I think it's a bit more realistic, uh, 10 to 20 years away, yeah. Okay. So hopefully, you know, if there are any kids watching, you know, they could be about the right age to be astronauts going to Mars, if that's what they'd like to do. Yeah, and I saw the other day that ESA have a call for astronauts yes, as well, that's so right. active, yeah. uh, active recruitment going on right yeah, now, if anyone's times. interested. <laughs> yeah. um, right, still lots more questions coming in. Thanks so much, Sarah, for staying and answering them. Um, can it be assumed that the age of CAIs and chondrules act as evidence confirming the age of the solar system or the minimum age of the solar system? Yeah, well, they give the minimum age of the solar system, correct. Yeah, because we think they're products of the solar system, their the chemistry and isotopes tell us that they are connected to our solar system. Uh, and so yeah, they give the minimum age. And um, because the CAI age is, is such a firm, a firm age, there's never anything older than that. So that's why 
we think this might represent this time zero of when, when the sun was actually first collapsing, the real sort of beginning of the solar system. But it's very hard to um, connect the age of these solids to the age of a star. Okay. A um, couple of questions about the Oort cloud. Apologies because I've pronounced that incorrectly. One is, is it spherical? And somebody else asks, was it weakly attached to the solar system and are Oort clouds shared between the solar systems? And uh, what was the last bit? Sorry, are things shared? Are, are Oort clouds shared between solar systems? Oh, great question. Oh, <laughs> yes, I, I hope so a little bit. But uh, yes, yeah, so first of all, yeah, it is spherical. So it's different to the rest of the solar system in that respect. So the rest of the solar system is all basically on one plane because it formed from one disk. And the Oort cloud is, yeah, they're just bodies that are kind of sort of attached to the sun very vaguely. Um, so I think it extends almost a quarter of the way to the nearest next star. It's, it's insanely big and very, very likely that stars exchange uh, material amongst themselves. And, and also these stellar nurseries like the Orion Nebula, for example, you actually have lots of stars forming quite close together. And uh, so I think there's a very high probability of exchange between these uh, material in these stellar clusters. Okay. Um... Are nebulae like the one you showed the product of lots of smaller stars having gone nova or are they the product of one giant star going nova? Right okay uh, so yeah so that's a great question because that's the sort of question we can actually answer using meteorites so we can make um, isotope composition uh, isotope measurements of meteorites to look at um, yeah where, where the material in our solar system came from. Um, but it looks like they are likely to be a product of, of many, many different uh, stars, different types of stars as well. So a mixture, at least our solar system is a mixture of red giants and supernovae and novae. So lots of all sorts of different stars contributed to our solar system. And it's very likely that's also the case in most other uh, nebulae as well. But maybe not all. Right. Maybe not all. So, yeah, we can have environments. Um, is there any chance that Voyager 1 may still encounter meteorites in its outer space journey? Yeah, absolutely. Fantastic. I mean, yeah. And if there's a follow-up question to this as well, which is if it does encounter meteorites or planets, will it still be able to tell, so will it still be able to tell us about them? I think it's still beaming stuff back, isn't it? I think. Okay. I'm actually not 100% sure about um, the Voyager missions, but I think yeah, I can't remember whether they're, st they're still beaming back or not. I mean, so it might encounter something. The probability is very low because, um, so the probability, for example, of a spacecraft encountering an asteroid when it goes through the asteroid belt is supposed to be about one in a billion. And um, and the asteroid belt is much denser than the Oort cloud. So okay. the odds are actually very low, but it would be great. Um, comes question here about carbonations carbonaceous material. Why does the Earth have so little carbonaceous material in terms of bulk composition? It seems very low in comparison with chondrites, for example. Yeah, it is. So yeah, so chondrites and especially carbonaceous chondrites are much uh, richer in carbon and other volatiles than the Earth. Um, so that's because the Earth, when it formed it, lost uh, many of its uh, volatile elements. So it's probably because <clears throat> Probably because it was so hot when it formed that a lot of um, volatile elements um, were removed, were evaporated. Okay. Um, ejected planets were mentioned. Do you expect there to be many ejected planets between the stars? Yeah, I mean, that's something that we, we don't really know about very much. And um, so the ejected planets idea came from these models of planet migration. And um, Planet migration itself is, is, is a fairly new concept. It's only been around for about 15 years or so. Um, and so we, we think that planets migrated in our solar system, but they migrate even more in other planetary systems. Um, so that would mean there would be uh, planets kind of roving around. But the problem is they're very hard to detect because we can only see um, planets around other star systems by looking at their effect on the star. And if they're just floating in space, they'd be almost invisible to us. Okay, so they could be hiding from us. Yes. Um, 
Another question about solar wind. So my understanding is that the edge of the solar system is the shock wave formed by the solar wind, as beyond this is effectively interstellar space. Where is this front compared to the Oort cloud? Um, I think the Oort cloud is beyond that. So yeah, so it's, yeah, okay. it, then it's maybe not part of the solar system by that definition. Okay, just and just a couple more questions. I think I've covered yeah. most people. Uh, we've had, yeah, we've had like over 50 questions come in. So lots of people <laughs> right. stimulated by the talk. Um, the early dust clouds from which, from suns were, which suns are formed were cold. What made the sun so hot? Likewise, why is the Earth's core so cold? Say that again, why is the, why is the sun so hot? Is that right? So it's the early dust clouds from which the suns are formed were cold. Yeah. What makes the sun so hot? And likewise, why is the Earth's core so cold? Um, well, the, I mean, the sun is hot because it is a nuclear reactor and it's fusing hydrogen into helium. But it started to, to warm up as it started to collapse. It converted potential energy into kinetic energy and that made it hotter. So it it's hot partly because it was collapsing, but mostly it's hot because it's a massive nuclear reactor that's creating new elements. Uh, and the Earth's core, so the Earth gets most of its um, heating from uh, the decay of radioactive elements. So the abundance of radioactive elements de de determines its uh, temperature. So, I mean, it's not, it's, 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 it's cold, but it's not super cold. And because it's not fusing elements, it's much colder than the sun. Um. Where might we find dark matter in our Milky Way? I don't know. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> um, do, is there anything else? Anybody? Oh, how how long will it take for the Earth to move out of its orbit? I think the Earth's in a fairly stable orbit. It's going to be there okay. till the Never. sun dies <laughs> forever. <laughs> yeah, forever. Well, for yeah, for at least for the next five billion years while the sun's still alive. Um, and then two more questions, and then I think we'll bring the talk to a close. But we have just one in the chat on why do we only have one sun in our solar system and not two? Yeah, I don't know. That's a great question because a lot of stars are binary stars. Um, and I think we have a lot to learn still about. I mean, I guess the big question that we all want to know is, are we special? Are we alone in the universe? Is there anything that made us different? And um yeah, things like having one star may play into that, but... Um, so still to be I found out. Know. People on this talk could find this out in the future. Yes, please. As yes, part of their yes, own research. Yes, please. <laughs> um, and then just very lastly, some people have... Uh, lots and lots of people saying thank you. Uh, it's been a fantastic Aww. talk. And somebody has asked awesome. if you can re recommend any uh, publicly accessible books or resources for people who might want to learn more about this topic. Um, yeah, so um, oh, I'd suggest so my my uh, colleague uh, Caroline Smith and I wrote a book about meteorites, which is on Amazon. Um, uh, I don't know. I have to think. Can I? Can I? I'll let you know. I can send you a reading. Yeah, absolutely. We'll we'll add some notes to uh, the YouTube link um, as and when we have them. Great. Thanks so much, Sarah, for kicking off our Year of Space public lecture series. What a fantastic Thanks. tour of the solar system. And thank you all to joining in. We've had hundreds of people join in to this, to this webinar. Uh, thank you. There are 65,000 known meteorites in collections, in museums and universities around the world. And of those, we think around 99% come from asteroids. And they can tell us so much about the diversity of the asteroid belt from meteorites made mostly of iron that tell us that, that some asteroids are just cores of planetesimals uh, to meteorites that are made uh, of a much more 
porous and volatile rich material, the carbonaceous chondrites, that uh, tell us that some asteroids are really water rich and organic rich. Um, so meteorites are an incredible resource for learning uh, about the asteroid belt. And uh, there was a super exciting thing happened on the 28th of February, 2021 this year. This massive fireball was observed over a lot of England and Wales uh, coming in. So it was uh, reported by over a thousand eyewitnesses. It was also seen on CCTVs and door cams, all sorts of things. And as well as that, it was also recorded by uh, meteor camera networks uh, that are cameras pointing at the sky looking for exactly this sort of event. And from all of this data, we could reconstruct firstly where the, where the fireball was heading so we could work out where a meteorite would, was going to land. And also we could reconstruct where it had come from. So uh, quite unusually for fireballs, because we don't usually have enough data to be able to do this, we managed to work out this fireball actually came from an orbit in the outermost part of the asteroid belt out towards Jupiter. So again, this gives a really good link between a meteorite and asteroids. Um, and having that information about where it came from makes it, it really so much more scientifically valuable. The meteorite fell as a shower of material over an area a few miles wide. The biggest bit landed into the driveway of a family that lived in the middle of Winchcombe town in the Cotswolds. And it actually fragmented when it landed and now, and it just became this pile of dust and rubble. Um, so as well as collecting all of the little bits of, of meteorite, we also brushed up the tiny bits of dust that were on the driveway using a toothbrush to get every tiny little teensy bit up. Uh, and also, because it left a little crater, we're hoping to be able to uh, remove the whole part of the driveway so that we can keep this piece of driveway with a little crater in it as, as one of our museum exhibits as well. So, so that was the main bit of the meteorite. And then uh, several universities from across the UK uh, went on a field trip to look for extra bits of uh, the meteorite. And a team from the University of Glasgow found uh, a sizable piece over 100 grams in a sheep's field. And as soon as my colleagues and I saw it, we were jumping up and down excited because we could see straight away, it was so dark, it was black, and we knew this was a carbonaceous chondrite. And these are my favorite meteorites because um, they, we think these represent the, our best examples of what the early solar system looked like. Uh, so they've stayed cold their whole lifetimes. And so they're just a, a frozen relic of what the beginning of the solar system looked like. They've been in a geologically dead asteroid for four and a half billion years. And they're made up of constituents of early solar system uh, materials, what was floating around in the protoplanetary disk before the planets were around. Um, so we're super, super excited uh, to have this, have this meteorite to analyze. And uh, we've, we've uh, developed an analysis team uh, to look at it in more detail. And one of the things that was quite striking and, and timely was looking at it, it it's, it's really black and it's got little white speckles. It looks very reminiscent of material brought back from asteroid Rugu uh, by the Japanese space mission Hayabusa 2. So Hayabusa 2 returned back to Earth in December 2020, uh, bringing back about five grams of of pieces of the C-type asteroid Rugu. And uh, just, the, the, just the simple visual similarity of them is quite remarkable. Uh, so we need to do more analyses of both meteorite and Rugu material to, to look at their similarities and differences. Uh, but the timing is fantastic because uh, we can use our meteorite to do uh, rehearsal analyses. And the, the final thing to say is uh, that we have the meteorite on display at the Natural History Museum, which is free to enter. So anyone in London can come and have a look at it um, and, and see it in the room called the Vault at the Natural History Museum.
At first glance, this single bright source, this smudge, this grouping doesn't look like much. Images like these are translated for our eyes, and it's because our eyes only can perceive a small region of all the frequencies of light. Astrophysics is much more than just capturing different wavelengths of light. Many objects or phenomena are simply too far away to directly image. A lot of data comes from pixel-sized point sources, and those points provide astrophysicists with a powerful window into what makes up the universe. Even now, most of what scientists learn about the cosmos comes from studying light. Astronomers can work out distances, speeds, sizes, temperatures, and the composition of elements because matter behaves in predictable and consistent ways. They do this by literally prying these photons apart. This is spectroscopy. Explained. Spectroscopy is the study of how matter interacts with light. And it all began with a prism, like this one. Light entering one side of the prism bends or refracts as it passes through the triangle shape and exits out the other side. All of the wavelengths enter together, but they exit as a rainbow-like spread of colors. What's happening is that the shorter, more energetic wavelengths, like blue and violet, bend a little more than the longer, lower energy light, like red and orange. Because they bend at slightly different angles, the wavelengths separate, fanning out into a band of colors. NASA has a whole fleet of telescopes that can split and study a wide range of light on the electromagnetic spectrum, not just the light that our eyes can detect. So Hubble can detect through the visible spectrum, but also a bit into the infrared and the ultraviolet. Webb is just infrared and can look at the light that is emitted from billions of years ago. And of course, the images from Webb are really spectacular, but this is what flutters the hearts of scientists. This spectrum shows a light that penetrated the atmosphere of a planet called WASP-96b. The light being measured comes from the planet's host star, some of which skims through the atmosphere. Humans are a long way from directly imaging exoplanets, so telescopes like Webb will use spectroscopy to find those chemicals that could support life in their atmospheres. Which is why Webb's first spectra is so amazing. You're actually seeing bumps and wiggles that indicate the presence of water vapor in the atmosphere of this exoplanet. Incredible. But it's one thing to identify single elements or simple molecules, but deciphering whole foreign bodies like Dr. Owajawak. Sure, How again, do you I know? Zoom... Oh my god, it took us a very long time to figure this out. It really took us many, many decades, and it took us many, many fantastic new instruments. If all of our astrophysical <laughs> objects, or anything that we're looking at, were made up of one element, this would just be so easy. But we don't. So, we have to do experiments on Earth, like this, to prove what we're looking at looks like what we are thinking we're looking at. So, in here is argon. If we turn it on here, it glows this really pretty purple. And then if we look at it with a spectroscope, it shows us a very specific fingerprint to argon. These are called spectral tubes. My bounty of tubes. They contain the gas of one element, and the box runs a voltage through the tube. When I turn on the switch, hey. the charged gas turns to plasma and emits a color that is unique to that one element. It also makes unique lines when you look through the spectroscope. And this one is helium. This same process happens in a star or a hot region of gas. So we use tubes like this to verify what we see in space. If you do a quick search for spectroscopy data, there are numerous ways that the data can appear. Those variations are based on the source of the cosmic light. There are three types of spectra that we can use. Continuous, emission, 
and absorption. Light from a hot, dense source, like the sun, produces a continuous spectrum. When that light passes through cooler gases on its way to us, the gases take away or absorb some of that energy. Dark lines appear where specific colors are missing. And when thin gases glow themselves, we see only their characteristic colors, kind of like a cosmic barcode. These are the emission spectra from pure elements that were given a voltage to glow, just like my spectra tube, but way better. Like all data, there is an art to analyzing spectra. Scientists like Dr. Owajawak use computers to calculate and tease out clear signals, comparing them then to models that are already known. Many scientists in the labs on Earth, they try to recreate the same conditions and, and measure basically what these um, kind of, as you said, fingerprints of those different transitions for different elements are. Okay, so we're always comparing to sort of the fingerprint of what we have. And yes. then if it has deviated from that, that is the new information from what we're looking at. Correct. For Anna, spectra unveil the structures of black holes, the swirling winds that surround them, and those big jets of particles that come out of them. When you look at a black hole, yes, this is what you see. Yes. Where, where's the accretion disk? Where are the yeah. winds? So all of this is mostly accretion disk at this level. It's just different parts of it. We can zoom in, right? And we see all of the absorption lines, right? All of these lines are also shifted a lot. So they come from this wind that we saw in the, in the first picture. So that's how we know that there is winds blowing around black holes. The same principles apply no matter the wavelength of light. But each wavelength of light tells us a little something different about each character we find in the universe. It's pretty wild how different the universe looks to our eyes and how it presents to our telescopes. And that's precisely why we need to observe in different wavelengths of light. Modern astronomy is built upon spectroscopy. So with every stream of light we gather, we further understand what the universe is made of. All we need to do is pry open its contents. When Hubble was launched, one of its main objectives was to measure the Hubble constant, the expansion rate of the universe. Early. Yes, boy, stand by for a go for release. Minute late. Okay, Charlie. Flight PDRS. Go ahead. The telescope's released. Okay, thank you. Beginning in the mid 2000s, around 2005, um, I started a project to use uh, what are sort of the gold standard tools in astronomy for measuring distances, uh, which is to use pulsating stars called Cepheid variables and exploding stars called Type 1a supernovae, and of course the Hubble Space Telescope itself, and to try to make more precise measurements than had ever been made uh, as a check on the universe. New observations from the early history of the universe, what's called the cosmic microwave background, we're beginning to make very precise predictions of how fast the universe ought to be expanding today. And so we wanted to follow up on that by making comparably precise measurements. First, it was the WMAP, Cosmic Microwave Background Satellite, that NASA flew in the early 2000s. And then that gave way to Planck, the European Space Agency satellite, that was even more precise. So by measuring the Cosmic Microwave Background and then using a model that we call the Standard Model of Cosmology to then extrapolate that to the present time, they determined ultimately that the universe ought to be expanding at, uh, in funny units that we use, 67.4 plus or minus 0.5 kilometers per second per megaparsec, which roughly means the universe will double in about 10 billion years. Using the Hubble Space Telescope and some of these tools, the Cepheid variables and the Type 1a supernovae, 
we determined the local expansion rate to be about 73.0 plus or minus 1.0 kilometer per second per megaparsec, which is the most precise local or present measurement of the expansion rate. But it differs from the expected value, expected that is by the state of the universe shortly after the Big Bang, coupled with our understanding of the universe, this cosmological model. And in fact, those two now sit apart from each other by about five times their mutual error bar, which is a phenomenon we call now the Hubble tension. To give you an analogy, it would be like uh, if you had a small child and you measured their height uh, when they were two years old, that would be like the cosmic microwave background measurement. And then you used a model of how children grow to predict how tall they ought to end up at adulthood, and that would give you a height. And then you would actually measure when they grew up how tall they were. Uh, and so that's the comparison we're making, the present state of the measurement versus what is a very precise measurement in a younger universe and then a model like the growth curve of a child to predict how tall they will be. Except unlike a child, we've seen many children grow. We have a very good understanding of that growth curve, but we've only ever seen one universe and it's full of stuff whose nature we don't deeply understand. And so it's not crazy to think that we might be missing something in that understanding. In order to predict and really extrapolate the state of the universe from the beginning to the present day, we have to understand components of the universe, particularly two components whose nature is not well understood but make up 96% of the universe, and that's dark matter and dark energy. Dark energy makes up about 70%, and uh, dark matter probably makes up about 25 to 27%. And we don't really understand at a detailed level what these are exactly, we don't understand their microphysics. So in order to make these predictions, we assume that they are their most vanilla or plainest possible forms. We see this tension then, and so one possibility, not the only possibility, is that they are more complicated, that there's a more complex story, uh, or some other aspect even that we've been missing about the universe. The Hubble Space Telescope has more or less been working on measuring the Hubble constant for its entire lifetime, about 30 years. So the original goal when it was launched was to measure it to 10% uncertainty, and I think that was successfully accomplished in the early 2000s. We're now on sort of what I would say is the second generation of measurements of the Hubble constant that are targeting closer to percent level precision. And I think Hubble, especially with its new instruments, has absolutely come through with the capabilities needed. Hubble really has delivered the quality and caliber of data that's necessary to make these measurements. And with that, we'll uh, close uh, now with the uh, OSIRIS-REx uh, mission to uh, Bennu. Um, if uh, you're wondering what OSIRIS-REx uh, stands for, that's shown on the second line there. Um, it's quite, quite a long bow. Origin, Spectral Interpretation, Resource Identification and Security, Regulus Explorer. And um, so it, it came and dropped its uh, sample uh, back on the 24th of September, but the mothership kept going on to the uh, asteroid Apophis, which was the one that was, uh, there was a reasonable chance of that running into the Earth at some stage in the future. And uh, so they've now recalled the mission OSIRIS uh, Apex. Um, for that uh, one, and um, I think it's more to go and have a look at this uh, asteroid rather than bring a sample back. I think they've they've already um, shot their bolt uh, in the sense of uh, bringing uh, bringing that sample back uh, from Bennu. Now um, I wasn't able to actually find a video anywhere on the internet, and I tried my darndest to uh, show everything of the um, Osiris mission from launch to uh, where it is today. So I've put put one together from uh, various sources and um, put, uh, put it to a bit of music called uh, The Journey, which is uh, no copyright music. And uh, this goes for about uh, two, two and a bit minutes.
when it uh, took its sample, the head that took the sample was only about 30 centimetres across. And um, they, they thought they had a certain mass in there, but uh, when, when they opened it up uh, fairly recently and had a look inside, it was 100 grams more than what they thought. And plus it also contaminated all the avionics, uh, quite aside from the uh, sample section. So they're still not sure how the sample managed to go, go around all the electronics and the working bits and the parts of uh, the craft that it wasn't uh, meant to go in and uh, probably just as well that um, there wasn't anything nasty in there because there's been plenty of science fiction movies uh, where uh, they bring life back uh, from uh, an asteroid or a meteorite and uh, there's one um, uh, if ever you've seen it called a quiet place where uh, where something nasty comes back uh, from a meteorite from uh, in this ca that case a, a comet that they refer to it as an asteroid in the movie close the October meeting and hopefully we'll see you with the November meeting, <laughs> which is the last for uh, the year. Okay, thank you.